Hello Year 6 and welcome to the next instalment of Storytime with Mr Ford as voted for by the Phoenix and Luna Bubble Class. Thank you very much. So as always I'm going to be reading so you don't need to be looking at this. You just need to be listening so get yourself a cup of tea, chocolate biscuit, who am I to judge and listen on. So this is the next chapter of Gargantis and it's called Blaze. Aye, declare the fisherman forming a threatening crowd. By the beard of St Dismal this bottle is ours. Dr. Tulassi raises his finger and protests, just as Mrs. Fossil puts her hands on her hips and does the same. The atmosphere grows heated, and Mr. Mollus tries to break into the argument, telling everyone to leave. Nearby, momentarily forgotten despite being the cause of all this trouble, the strange glass bottle quivers again and gives its eerie flicker. I'm just beginning to think that some sort of riot is about to break out in the hotel, when I notice somebody pushing his way from, um, to the front of the fisherman. He's a boy, a few years older than me and Vi tall and gangly and wearing oil-stained overalls that are far too short in the leg. He's pale and freckled with a flop of red hair over one eye. His eyes go wide when he sees the bottle and he starts to speak but his voice is drowned out by the older men. So he does something unexpected. He snatches the bottle up and holds it over his head. If this fishbowl should go to anyone, declares the boy in a cracked teenage voice, it should go to my uncle Squint. He's... he was... The boy falters as all eyes in the lobby swivel to look at him. His cheeks flare with embarrassment as if they are trying to compete with his hair and his arms begin to tremble. Careful, Dr. Tulassi and Mrs. Fossil cry together. The boy lowers the bottle back to the floor and everyone breathes out in relief. Your uncle, says the wiry old fisherman. Old Squint Westerly? Of course, the boy replies. He knows more about Eerie Script than anyone. Dr. Tulassi looks offended at this, while the fishermen fidget and grumble to one another. When the wiry fisherman speaks again, his voice has an edge of threat in it. Now I'm not one to speak ill of the dead, he says, and everyone already knows that Squint Wesley liked to poke his nose where no nose should be poked. But he's paid the ultimate price for his curiosity, lad, and left you all alone. You cannot claim the bottle for him now. But this bottle might give us the answers, the boy blurts out. It might help us uncover the truth about St. Dismal and... Truth? The wary fisherman looks aghast. We don't need any truth about St. Dismal, bless his beard. We already have his laws, and those laws have served us well for centuries. But... Enough! The wary fisherman bellows. You cannot claim this bottle for a dead man, Blaze Westerly, no matter how much you miss him. And maybe if Squint had stuck to fishing instead of exploring and inventing and looking for answers to questions that don't need answering, he wouldn't have got himself drowned. No. This bottle is nothing but a bad omen, and if I had my way, I'd throw it back in the sea. You will do no such thing, cries Mrs. Fossil. I found it, and it will have pride of place in the window of my flotsoporium. As a precious historical artefact, Dr. Slassy interrupts, this bottle belongs in my museum. And at that, the argument seems set to erupt again. But just then, there's a loud familiar ting that reverberates around the lobby. Everyone turns to look in the direction of the beautiful old, old hotel elevator. The door slides open with a clack and a golden light spills out. Silence falls, broken only by the rumble of the storm outside. Then something emerges from the lift. It's an antique looking electric wheelchair made of bronze and wicker. Sitting in it is an even more antique looking lady in a silk turban, tucked under a blanket embroidered with a crest of the hotel. Her face is wizened like that of an old tortoise. Her mouth is surrounded by frothy white foam, and on her lap is a silver bowl with water sloshing in it. With one hand, she guides the wheelchair forward with the use of a control box, and with the other, she holds aloft a foamy toothbrush, as if it's, sword, as if it's a sword she's just pulled from a stone. I was brushing my tooth, the lady says in a creaky old voice, when I heard commotion. Mr. Mollus, can I explain to me what is happening in my hotel? Lady Kraken, I whisper, clutching my cap. That's Lady Kraken, Vi whispers back. I'm not sure I've ever actually seen her. And that's not surprising. Lady Kraken, the owner of the Grand Nautilus Hotel, lives in a vast suite of rooms on the top floor. She hardly ever leaves the rooms, and very few people in the town will ever have clapped eyes on her at all. Even I have only seen her a handful of times, and that was enough to last me forever. Your ladyship, cries Mr. Mollusk, raising his hands in a motion that seems to say, Don't blame me, and I can explain all at once. I, I was just dealing with a little disagreement, an indelicate unpleasantness, a regrettable misunderstanding of a most peculiar kind, a... Stop wittering, man, and spit it out, snaps Lady Kraken. She looks around at the group of wild-haired fishermen, at Mrs. Fossil with her many soggy layers, at the dock with his skew-whiff bow tie, 
and at the hotel staff cowering behind Mr. Mollusk. Is it a revolution? It is more in the nature of beach combing dispute, Mr. Mollusk clasped his hands together. An item of alleged significance has come to light. Has been found, declares Mrs. Fossil, by me. Been found, Mollusk continues, an item that the doctor thinks is of some value. Historic value, that is, Lady Crackham. The doctor gives a respectful nod in the old lady's direction. Historic value indeed, Mr. Mollusk grins desperately at Dr. Tlassie. But the fishermen seem to feel strongly the item is theirs by right. And so it is, declares the wire old fisherman. It is a dismal business. As if conjured by these words, the storm spews lightning and thunder once more, shaking the hotel to its foundations. Everyone looks skyward in alarm, while Mr. Mollusk cowers before his employer. But I assure you, your ladyship, I have it all under control. Lady Kraken propels her electric wheelchair past the hapless hotel manager as if he isn't there, and she comes to a whirring halt beside the strange fish-shaped bottle. And this is it, she says, the cause of all the hullabaloo. She unhooks an antique back scratcher from the side of her chair and gives the bottle a good sharp tap. The bottle shudders and the eerie light flickers inside once again. It is, says the red-haired boy. He approaches the old lady respectfully, clutching a skipper's cap in his hands. My uncle would have known what to do with it. And where is this knowledgeable uncle now? Lost, the boy says. At sea. Lady Kraken squints at him. And you think this bottle might be a clue to finding him again? The boy says nothing, but you can tell from his face that he does. And what is your name, young man? Lady K asks. Blaze, the boy stares at the floor. Blaze Westerly. Well, Mr Westerly, I've had enough claims for now. The lady twirls her toothbrush. Maybe I should just claim this old fish old bottle for myself. After all, it isn't my hotel lobby. There's a rumble of discontent at this, but no one, not even the fisherman, seems brave enough to argue with the venerable owner of the Grand Nautilus Hotel. But of course I won't, Lady Kraken continues, giving the bottle another tap. I already know it doesn't belong to me. Deep down, everyone always knows whether or not something really belongs to them. And she sweeps a wizened eye over everyone in the room. What do we need right now? She continues. Is someone wise and true to decide on the rightful owner of this curious bottle? Couldn't you do that, your ladyship? Mr. Mollis bows with an in ingratiating smile. I'm sure you could. No, I don't have time for this. The lady waves the suggestion away. Beside, I already have someone to handle such matters for me. You do? Says Dr. Tlassi. Actually, says Lady Kraken, and he's been here all along, listing in on everything from his hiding place over there. Isn't that right, Herbert Lemon? And I freeze where I am, peering over the desk of my lost and foundry, as everyone in the lobby turns to look at me. Okay, that was chapter seven of Gargantist. I hope you are enjoying, and I will see you guys next time for the next instalment.